Printing is like religion, Alec Bolton once said. We live in sin, but with the hope of perfection before us. <laughs> Yuma, good evening. Welcome everyone here to the National Library of Australia to this very special event, Makers of Books, celebrating 50 years of National Library of Australia publishing. I'm Luke Hickey, I'm the Assistant Director General of the Engagement Branch here at the National Library. And as we begin, I would like to acknowledge Australia's First Nations peoples, the First Australians as the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet. Uh, give my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge their enduring connection to this land, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, thank you for joining this event. It's wonderful to have a great crowd here in the theatre with us, uh, but also to those of you who are online. Um, we're coming to you from the National Library here on beautiful Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. As you drove in this evening, you may have noticed uh, fl our flags at half-mast uh, and perhaps heard the 96-gun salute commemorating the life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The library is deeply saddened by Her Majesty's death. Her Majesty reigned for 70 years and visited Australia 16 times, so it is not surprising that our collections and those of many other institutions contributing to Trove are full of items demonstrating Her Majesty's role in Australia's national life. We invite you to explore these moments, including through a Trove collection feature that will be presented on our website shortly. Despite this sad news, it is still a particular pleasure to see so many of you here tonight for this celebration of 50 years of publishing here at the library. Firstly, we will hear from our Director General, Dr. Mari Louise Ayres, who will share with us some of the history of publishing here at the National Library of Australia. Later, Michael Richards, our author of Maker of Books, Alec Bolton and his Brindabella Press will speak to us about Alec Bolton, the National Library of Australia's first publisher, and the passion and dedication with which he ran Brindabella Press. Michael Richards has been a bookseller, a librarian at St Anne's College, Oxford, and the National Library of Australia, a historian and exhibitions curator, and is now a letterpress printer. He received his first tutorial on the upright Platon Press by Alec Bolton himself, and began collecting Alec Bolton's Brindabella Brindabella Press Books in 1987. Like Alec, he regrets the wasted years when he was not printing. <laughs> Following both Mary Louise and Michael, we will be joined by Lexi Sikalis, creative producer, performer, and owner of Mill Theatre, who will be reading some special, uh, specially chosen excerpts of poetry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Louise Ayres. Thank you very much, and again, thank you for joining us tonight um, on Noonawal and Nambri country. And may I welcome you with words that I have been gifted by local custodians. Daro Anuna, Daro Anunawal, Yangu Narawiri Dunamanyan, Nunawari Darawari, Ningaradindi Wangari Jinyin. We meet to celebrate the 50th anniversary of NLA Publishing and to launch Maker of Books, Michael Richards' bibliography of Alec Bolton, the library's first publisher and an acclaimed book arts practitioner. A maker of books, Alec Bolton and his Brindabella Press touches briefly on Alec's time here at the library, but focuses primarily on the books he produced as the owner and operator of Brindabella Press, including several books written by his wife, the poet Rosemary Dobson. I was privileged to enjoy their friendship, and in fact, one of my most treasured possessions, possessions is um, a specially made unnumbered copy of Rosemary's Untold Lives. And Richard, uh, uh, Michael, you are never getting this out of my hands, OK? Uh, it's very special to me. At Brindabella, Alec elevated the art of bookmaking with his elegant, hand-printed and hand-bound editions. He carried into that work the ideals that he instilled in NLA Publishing as our inaugural publisher. His commitment to producing beautiful, high-quality books that share significant Australian stories and artworks with eager readers. Beautiful books that allow us to connect our library collections with who we are, who we were, and the aspiration we may have as individuals or as a nation. Now, Michael will speak to Alex's fine work at the Brindabella Press shortly, but first I'd like to take a look back at the, the, the first 50 years of publishing here at the library. The library had, of course, been publishing books since its establishment, but these were largely research guides and bibliographic publications. 
1971, Alec joined the library as our publisher and was tasked with ensuring that the library was sharing fully and effectively with scholars, students and the general reader the original manuscripts, fascinating pictorial records, rare books, literary, historical and social material in the library's collections. Now we have to remember that this was nearly two decades before our earliest forays into collection digitisation and in fact it was a decade before we started operating the National Union Catalogue and Interlibrary Loan Service. So 1971-1972, publishing works from our collection in book form was really our only option for sharing our collection beyond these walls. I think it's very easy these days to forget that. So Alex set about searching for stories in our collections, establishing a stable of authors, designers, editors and printers, and building NLA Publishing's reputation for delivering high quality books. 1972 was UNESCO's International Book Year with the slogan, Book for, Books for All. It was also the year that the National Library of Australia published its first NLA publishing title, most appropriately a brochure to support our exhibition, Book Design in Australia. In those early years, NLA Publishing produced several exhibition brochures, um, continued to produce bibliographic and statutory publications, and then in 1975 came its first major book, with Captain James Cook in the Antarctic and Pacific, the private journal of James Burney. And thanks to Alec's team and their work, our first book won a 1975 Australian Book Design Award, an award that a number of books produced in Alec's time, including the letters of Vance and Nettie Palmer in 1977 and Casno in 1978, would go on to receive. Casno was designed by Adrian Young, a frequent collaborator with Alec, and who we are pleased, pleased to have with us here tonight. The book showcased 85 images from the Harold Casno collection selected by Max Dupain. Dupain also penned an appreciation of Cas for the work, in which he wrote, his work is what matters, its place in the history of Australian photography and its influence on past, present and future generations of photographers. Borrowing that sentiment, the National Library has influenced generations of readers. We have a place in Australia's literary past, present and future. The publications we have produced over the last 50 years play a key role in this, as we have sought to identify stories in the national collection worth telling and sharing with a wide national audience. Now, Australia has changed a lot in the past 50 years, and of course it's changed a lot in the last two. But the library continues to carry out its mission to collect material that reflects the stories and people that make us who we are as a nation. We preserve and protect these records in whatever form they come. And tonight is a reminder that the publishing program has played a significant role in uncovering the stories that our collections can tell and in sharing them. Now, over the course of the past five decades, successive publishers, uh, starting with Alec, and then I think of the late Ian Templeman, who had executive responsibility for public programs, including publishing. Paul Hetherington, who's travelling and can't be with us tonight. Uh, Susan Hall, who is with us tonight. And now Lauren Smith have, of course, brought shifts in tone and emphasis. And in today's world, we have many more opportunities to provide access to our collections. The constant in these years has been NLA Publishing's commitment to opening up the library's collection for Australians wherever they are and creating books that have a profound impact, publishing the work of many of Australia's renowned artists, thinkers and writers. Around every part of Australia and the world, readers can hold the artwork of William T. Cooper, Peter Dombrovskis, Ellis Rowan, George Frank, French Angus, Frank Hurley, Joseph Lysage, and Olive Cotton in their hands. They can read about poets and postcards, cartoons and cartography, and see the handwritten journal entries of explorers, first fleet surgeons, mutineers and convicts. Importantly, Australians can read the carefully researched and often heavily illustrated work of historians and experts on topics as varied and diverse as the Antarctic, protesting and civil disobedience, fishing, 
fashion, bunch regards, the First World War and the Stolen Generations. In the late 1990s, the library was funded by the Commonwealth Government to carry out the Bringing Them Home Oral History Project. More than 600 hours over some 340 interviews were recorded of people involved in or affected by the policy of child removals. These oral histories are of enormous historical significance. They're full of intimate moments of dialogue, exchange, revelation and reflection. The NLA publication, Many Voices, published in 2002, captures these first-hand testimonies in hundreds of interview excerpts, contextualising comments with historical or biographical information to help readers to follow the stories that are being told. Many Voices was published with a CD that provided readers extracts from nine of those oral histories. And of course, those oral histories are now available to listen to online, CDs having been retired by the library a very long time ago. Now, the publication of that book represents the library operating at its truest, collecting, preserving, and making accessible significant parts of the Australian story. NLA Publishing was able to continue this truth with the publication of Sorry Day in 2018. Written by Coral Vass and illustrated by Dub Leffler, Sorry Day is a picture book that brought this essential and difficult part of our history to younger readers. It entwines two stories, a mother and child listening to then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's apology on 13 February 2008 and children being separated from their mother and driven off in the back of a truck in an earlier time, which is indeed what happened to Dub's mother. It's sometimes difficult to measure the impact of a book. It's not really about sales, but about the moments in which a reader, sitting with the book open before them, or being read aloud to them, or playing in their headphones, slips away from the present moment. The hubbub of other commuters on the bus, perhaps the quiet snoring of their partner, the chill of the air conditioning in their local library, and finds themselves absorbed into that book and to another world, into an artist's studio, to an opal mine in Cooper Pedy, to a boxing ring, to the grasslands of Wiradjuri country, to another time and place completely. It's about a reader carrying that knowledge forward, letting it shape and shift the way they understand the world, sharing it or building on their newfound knowledge with further research. These moments are invisible to us as publishers, but we know they exist by the shadows that they cast. Sorry Day, which received the 2019 Children's Book Council of Australia, of Australia Book of the Year Award in the Eve Pownall category, is just now being reprinted for the seventh time. Some 10,000 copies can be found in bookshops, homes and libraries. Families and class groups read this story together. I have read it multiple times to my five-year-old granddaughter, and each time there are new and incredibly difficult questions. As you'll read in A Maker of Books, no publishing venture is without its challenges. In some ways, this can be multiplied at a cultural institution, and it's not always been easy. But NLA Publishing does stand alone in its field in terms of longevity and in the breadth and depth of our program. The library's been able to work with many significant authors, some of whom have been able to join us tonight. We've published the work of leading lights from the art, fashion and entertainment worlds, including Helen Ennis, John Olson, Deborah Thomas, Sasha Grishin and Jennifer Byrne. Well-respected historians, academics and subject specialists, such as Penny Olson, Clive Hamilton, Anne Moyle, David Hill and Patricia Clark. Um, and, and actually Pat's sitting up the back there and Pat, we seem to have a spotlight right on you, which is as it should be, because in fact Pat's bringing out another book with us later on um, this year. And a host of other, ins other inspiring Australians such as Bob Brown, Judy Horacek, Anita Heiss, Brenda Nile, and Robert Drew. 
NLA's uh, publishing's most popular books are often the ones we are most proud of, not just because they've connected with readers, but because they tell important stories, showcase the collection, and celebrate language and creativity. Strangers on Country by David Hartley and Kirsty Murray, also illustrated by Dub Leffler, bring significant moments of First Nations history to young readers in a sensitive and interesting way. Journeys into the Wild, the photography of Peter Dombrovskis by Bob Brown, immerses readers in the misty beauty of Tasmania's wilderness and is a wonderful memento of the, two, the library's 2017 exhibition of Dombrovskis' work. This is Home, Essential Australian Poems for Children, edited by Jackie French, and Fair Dinkum by H.G. Nelson, are filled with beautiful, funny, and powerful words. And the late Tim Fisher's Steam Australia, launched in this room, uh, locomotives that galvanise the nation, brings the library's superb John Buckland a collection of train photography to a wider audience. In our recent interest, history, we've seen many of our books reach new audiences. We were delighted to publish the children's book on native animals, Who Am I?, written by our then publisher, Susan Hall, in Ghana language in 2019 as Nana Nai. We've sold rights to books, both children's and adult, into China and India. And Stephanie Owen Reader's thrilling true tale, Lenny the Legend, is in pre-production with Roadshow Films. So there are many more titles that deserve commendation, but we would miss out on the part of the evening when uh, we get to say hello and speak to each other if I went on. But in closing, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to our authors for forging paths into our collections and lighting the way so that others may follow. Thank you to the illustrators who have given shape and form to our stories. Thank you to our editors, proofreaders and designers who have striven to publish beautiful books. And thank you to our volunteers who have assisted us in so many ways, most re recently of all things by knitting for us. And also thank you to our distributor, New South Books, for getting our books into as many corners of the country as possible, and to the many booksellers and librarians who recommended our books to curious readers. To all of our former and current staff and those others around the library who've contributed so richly, thank you for working here at the library with passion and dedication and showing us your heart on every page that you help to produce. Uh, and in fact, I think nowhere is that more apparent than in this very, very beautiful special edition of Michael's book. 50 years on, NLA publishing remains an important part of the National Library's mandate to open up our vast collections so that Australians can explore and use them meaningfully. In the coming years, we are looking forward to bringing readers new biographies, art books, social and cultural histories, natural history titles and books for children. We'll continue to celebrate our anniversary with a, a rotating display of NLA books in the main reading room that will show off 50 books from our 50 years. And in the school holidays, we'll be having some special story time events for younger readers. I'd now like to invite Lexi Seculus to the front to read some poems by Judith Wright and Rosemary Dobson. Thank you, Lexi. The Rainforest by Judith Wright. The forest drips and glows with green. The tree frog croaks his far off song. His voice is stillness, moss and rain drunk from the forest ages long. We cannot understand that call unless we move into his dream where all is one, and one is all, and frog and python are the same. We, with our quick, dividing eyes, measure, distinguish, and are gone. The forest burns. The tree frog dies. Yet one is all, and all are one. The Continuance of Poetry, a Selection, 
by Rosemary Dobson. We have seen you off as far as the yellow box tree. Returning, I sit for a little while, reflecting on the long white clouds low at the horizon. The wind sharpens the distant brindabellas. In the courtyard, the fallen plum blossom settles. There will be time enough, and time enough later, for crossing the threshold to lamplight and conversation. When you set out on your long journey, the houses of your friends become empty. Rooms resounded with the need of reassurance, but here on the page are your messages. Here are poems, stones, shells, water. The one waits in the hand. This one is shining. This one is yellow. And this smooth to the fingers. Ching, chink, says this one, clear as a wind bell. Poems are set about in the empty rooms of houses. Windows open on clouds in the blue distance. White water pours down the hillside. On the rock, two fish swim under the water. Flannel flowers splash in a falling torrent, push aside boulders, spill over the ledges. Held still in the eye like a fish carved in sandstone, they become a white cloud visiting the rock face. When people lend books to each other, their meaning is giving. They bestow excitement, joy, imagination. You lent me Rothko, I lent you Mirandi. We exchanged whole art galleries, museums, sculpture, encyclopedias. Years ago, I said, here is Popper. You said, here is Berryman. Who owned up to the coffee rings on the Manet, which had to go back to the Kingston Library? All, all were returned long ago. Now they are gone. I hold them. Thank you so much, Lexi. Um, talk about bringing excitement, joy, and imagination and bringing those words off the page. Thank you. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce the star of tonight's show, uh, Michael Richards. Thank you. You're a sea of fa uh, blank faces to me because I'm we wearing my reading glasses, so uh, I won't be able to see if there's any responses. Um, that's probably just as well. I, I begin by acknowledging that we meet on the traditional land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm deeply grateful to the National Library of Australia for publishing this book. And I thank all who've helped me write it, including many who, like me, have had the privilege of working or have worked in the past at the library. I thank the Bolton family for its encouragement and friendship over many years, including Rob and James, who are here today, as well as Lysant, Ian and Nicola, all of whom could not get to Australia for the occasion. Thank you also to Dr. Marie-Louise Ayres for her welcome and her contribution to the book. To Lauren Smith, Amelia Hartney, and the rest of the publications team at the library, and to Dr. Karen Florence, who encouraged me at every step on the way. There's a long list of acknowledgements in the book. Such lists can, of course, be treacherous things. If I've left anybody out, I apologize from the bottom of my heart. In 1966, in a signed opinion piece in Art and Australia, Alec Bolton made one of his rare public statements on political matters. 
Writing in the aftermath of the resignation of Jorn Utzon as architect of the Sydney Opera House, he was dismayed at the likely impact. While he lamented the lack of a, quote, intelligent, sympathetic mediator, able to interpret the views of a great artist and the prudent banker's attitude, as he put it, of the New South Wales state government to each other, for him the dispute raised a larger issue. The fact is that where a work of art is concerned, money may cease to have ordinary meaning, he argued. All that counts is the work itself and the necessity of acquiring it. While he agreed that the state government was correct in seeking to rein in the rising cost of the Opera House construction, the cost of Utzon's departure was also high. To quote, Australia will face the awful fact of having spent many millions of dollars only to end up with a less than original, less than perfect building. This would be the most bitter cost of all. Again, something quite beyond reckoning in terms of money alone. When a few years later, he became a private press printer, similar considerations prevailed. During his time at the National Library, the books of his Brindabella Press all either broke even or made a small loss, even though he was investing more and more in their production as his ambitions and skills grew. He possibly made around $70 on The Exiled Immortal, the pamphlet written by Harold Stewart, which cost him four years of negotiation and heartbreak. And I do mean that. It was a very difficult saga. It was the one book that he came close to abandoning, he confessed to, to some friends. Ironically, though, in the early years, that was perhaps his biggest profit maker. Times and Places, his first hardback, netted $16.50, which went to the author. His pricing policy initially aimed at maintaining that principle after he left the library and the security of a public service income. The book was the thing, and what mattered was that its makers, author, illustrator, printer, binder, were happy with it, even if compromises were forced by costs. At the same time, it should be said, his books had to pay their own way, and if need be, would cost more than some might anticipate. I'm trying to do books up to a standard rather than down to a price, he told Jeff Page in 1987. That's what my subscribers expect. The content of the book is my first interest, but after that, the production has to come out right, and I'm not willing to work within price ceilings and limitations. At the same time, I'm not aiming at absurd prices, and I should just add that up until now, I have not made any profits personally out of my printing." End quote. On the other hand, a big deficit on one book would severely limit his subsequent publications. He couldn't afford a major loss, and on occasion privately lamented the slowness of some booksellers in paying their bills. In later years, as his income from other sources declined, he began to take a larger interest in making a small profit. But apart from the bestseller that 12 lino cuts became, this was always modest, especially when measured against time spent on printing. And even then, he insisted on a 60-40 profit split with Barbara Hanrahan, with the lion's share going to her. I'm making this point at some length because to me it says something important about Alec. While he was always careful about money as a child of the Depression years, it was to him a means to an end, and the lack of it would not stop him from aiming for that end. It's likely that arriving in the security of a good public service job greatly advanced his ability to spend his free time on letterpress printing, but he would have got there in the end anyway. After all, his first steps into printing came during his time in London when he was working for Angus and Robertson, and by that time Rosemary had been nudging him in that direction for many years, since soon after they first met, in fact. To me, this is one of the reasons why his achievement matters today. At a time when the prospects for earning a living as a cultural worker are low, when growing inequality is challenging the hopes and aspirations of so many Australians, 
and corroding the notion, notion of this country as essentially egalitarian. And when so many fashionable indicators value wealth and profligate expenditure ahead of all else, his example of how to live a truly rich life is worth reflecting on. While writing this work, I've got to know him a great deal better than I did in his lifetime. Not that I knew him all that well when he was still alive, I hasten to add, although the several hours I spent talking to him in the Friends Lounge here at the library when I was writing a license to print in 1993 were deeply rewarding. I would never claim to have known him as well as many in this gathering. The person I now know quite well is the Alec of the paper trail, the worshipper of the god or goddess of the letterbox, as he once quipped to Philip Hodgins. The man who kept most, if not all, of his letters, notes, drawings, and trial efforts. That's the letters he received, and also copies of everything he wrote back. And then passed them on, via Rosemary, and with the assistance of Karen in sorting them, to the library, where they form a rich trove, giving insight into mid and late 20th century Australian writing and printing, especially of poetry. The Alec I know is also someone who completed a major oral history interview with Heather Rusden just days before his death, a reminder of the richness of that collection at the library as well, which Murray Louise has spoken about. This is particularly fitting, as he was himself a skilled oral history interviewer and wrote the library's first published manual for its interviewers. It was the manuscript collection that spoke to me when I started work on what was initially to be a short lecture about nine years ago. I had long felt that Alec deserved a fuller bibliographic effort than had been required for a license to print, which is really just a checklist of what had been published up till 1993. But when I sat down to begin working through the many, many metres of folders in his papers, I realised I really should aim for more given the richness of the collection. Happily, Lucent, Rob and Ian agreed, which I think must have been in some ways a difficult decision. Having a biographer rummaging around in the life of a much-loved parent must be one of the biggest challenges that can be faced by any family. They have been punctilious in giving me full access and in not asking for anything to be off limits, and I thank them again for their generosity. Of course, like any attempt to write about the past, the work of a biographer is always incomplete. As Edward Wilson Lee asks in his groundbreaking biography of the man who was in effect inventor of the card catalogue and first proponent in the West of universal bibliographic control, Hernando Colon, son of the man we know also as Christopher Columbus, quote, how does one make a life out of words and paper? Capturing the essence of another person using the crude tools of narrative is a challenge at the best of times. Out of the myriad events, a pattern must be discerned, a structure created in which the life makes sense and words must be found that resurrect the subject, conjuring for the reader the experience of being in their presence. But as Alec himself used to say, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing badly even if there isn't time or the resources to do it properly, in other words. I got that quote from Jan Fullerton, who said it was one of the most valuable things she ever learned in her early years at the library. And while I'm sure there are aspects of Alec's life which I have not explored, I decided to focus on the books he published under the imprint of the Brindabella Press, and also for some years, as I explain in the book, as the Officina Brindabella. This is perhaps lamentable, but to my mind, it also makes the intrusion of a biographer into someone else's life forgivable. You could put it quite simply. These are the things he made for public view, and this is my explanation of how and why. The how is important. As Alan Loney argues, it takes more than one person to make a book. And even the private press model of publishing, which supposedly relies on one person to do most of the work, almost always requires a high degree of collaboration, negotiation, and at times compromise. Some private press printers make their own paper, 
create their own illustrations, cast and even design their own type, but most don't. The richness of the Bolton papers here at the library is in part a matter of how completely these processes of negotiation are documented. Here it is worth quoting Loney. Quote, whatever it is that anyone writes, it is not and never can be that they're writing a book. People write poems, letters, short stories, memoirs, biographies, histories, articles, essays, theses, dissertations, novels, diaries, philosophies, plays, etc. but they never write a book. Books are manufactured by those who publish those writings in book form. A text does not become a book until it is published, and publishing means what it says. A writing is made available to the public by a multiplication of copies, not a multiplication of originals. A private text is made into a public service we call book. This nuanced understanding of publishing from a poet, writer on the nature of the book, and letterpress printer, whose own achievement is considerable, is worth reflecting on. The concept of publishing as a public service is also valuable and highly relevant to Alec. Nevertheless, although the principal component of the book concerns the publications of the Brindabella Press, it was important to explore the influences and events in Alec's life that led up to and shaped the press. So I do pay considerable attention to his childhood and to his early working life as an editor at Angus and Robertson and then with Eurus Smith. After that came a further stint with Angus and Robertson in their London office and finally his many years as the National Library of Australia's publisher. His long and happy marriage to Rosemary Dobson and their shared passions for Australian literature and good printing were both crucial. Apropos of the latter, the poet Alan Gould has remarked that, he, that Alec was more deeply knowledgeable about Australian writing than any other non-writer he knew. And while my emphasis has been on the press as Alec's achievement, I've also tried to show how completely Rosemary travelled with him through all this. She was his key advisor, a partner in the development of the press's ambitions, and always an enthusiast for its work. And finally, among the influences was his discovery of the world of the private presses during that brief sojourn in London, where he enrolled in night classes in printing at a time when letterpress was still being taught as foundational to good printing, despite the fact that offset lithography and photo typesetting were sweeping it away from mainstream printing. It's an era that we've lost sight of when it took seven years to uh, do a an apprenticeship as a printer. Uh, and when perhaps 10% or 15% of the workforce were caught up in the world of printing. While Alec's private press work drew on a lifelong career in publishing, the publications of the press can, I think, be seen as exemplary for many of us from other circles today. Alec came from the editorial managerial side of publishing, not from a career as a printer. His discovery of a personal avocation as a letterpress printer was made in midlife, moving in small and manageable stages from cards and pamphlets through quite straightforward commercially bound books to fine printing of a very high standard. He constantly sought to grow as a maker and to achieve a better result next time. Whatever one's vocation, his example is inspirational. At the same time, his deep engagement in his spare time with the hands-on practicalities of letterpress printing gave deep grounding to his professional career as a publisher and surely fed back into his achievement at the National Library of Australia, where he was responsible for so many fine books. It's interesting to see how many young practitioners of letterpress today, and there are many, believe it or not, come from digital backgrounds in graphic design and publishing. They too find the two worlds complementary. Alec's background in publishing did give him several key advantages. For a start, he had the familiarity with the Australian literary milieu of the day I've already mentioned. 
Although isolated in Canberra in the early years from all but a handful of other practitioners of the craft of letterpress printing, profoundly isolated in ways that I think we've forgotten since the internet changed everything, he was able to find and maintain links with a few key letterpress allies. They became friends he treasured and learned from, and several long series of letters in his papers, spanning many decades in some instances, give rich insight into his work. In later years, as Karen Florence has argued, his work would form a component in Canberra's flourishing in the 1980s as a city of the book, together with such factors as the work of Peter Herrell and the Graphic Investigation Workshop at the ANU, the foundation of the Canberra Craft Bookbinders Guild, and the regular meetings of the Colophon Society. The golden years, Sasha Grisham has called them. In addition, Alec had all the tact of an experienced commercial publisher with many years of experience in dealing with authors, those difficult people, as well as being an editor of great skill. Importantly, he continually demonstrated the ability to move on from problems with the determination to learn from them and to improve his technical and design skills. Working with his papers showed me how much his ability to negotiate difficult issues grew through failure as well as success. This was particularly the case with the complex relationship between writers and illustrators, which at times caused him considerable difficulty. His discussions with Les Murray over Ros Atkins' illustrator for The Sleep Out, which Lexi is going to read to us, are a good example. Murray had strong views on the subject of sleep outs, it turned out, and Alec had to abandon Atkins' first block, which had taken two weeks' work to produce, and ask her to start again, cutting another version, which was far more open to the elements. Murray wrote to him, stars and possums and full moons and night air and bats all visit you in a sleep out. He drew a detailed sketch of his own childhood sleep out, and this too is carefully preserved in Alex's papers here at the library. It is evident to anyone who looks at his books that Alec was deeply conservative in some ways with regard to printing and book design, albeit in the true sense of the word, keeping what matters from the past. He looked to letterpress and what it did best in an endeavour to print the best books he could given his resources. This wasn't out of a reactionary rejection of everything that was new, but was an endeavour to keep alive traditions of proven excellence, which were in danger of being lost in a world flooded with books produced cheaply by new technologies that had yet to prove their long-term value. Much as he admired the boldness of people such as Mike Hudson and Jadwiga Jarvis at their Ways Goose Press, their pushing at the boundaries was not for him even though at the end of his life, he had with surprising enthusiasm, at last embraced computer typesetting in order to print, by relief printing of course, from photopolymer plates. This conservatism in book design is quite evident when looking at the book that in many ways was his turning point in his early years, time given. It was the low standard of contemporary printing that Alec emphasised when he approached James Macaulay in 1975 to see if he had any suitable poems for publication by Brinda Bella, criticising the production of Macaulay's latest title. Quote, I've seen a copy of Music Late at Night and wish I'd been its printer. The poems are most beautiful, but the presentation is wretched, he said. <laughs> Music Late at Night was a 48-page stapled pamphlet in Agus and Robertson's Poets of the Month series, which is actually a, a really interesting attempt by the previously dominant publisher of Australian poetry to match the flood of cheap, offset printed, small press formats characteristic of the new Australian poetry movement of the 1960s and 70s. But its printing was indeed undistinguished and the result was highly ephemeral and very hard to find today if you're a collector. I, I had a look on the net yesterday and there's one copy for sale um, at the moment in Australia. Mind you, it's only $25, so if you're a, a collector of either Macaulay or the, you know, the origins of the Brindabella Press, go for it. Alec and Rosemary had been friendly with Macaulay for many years. 
He was someone she'd known at Sydney University when she was studying there in the 1940s, and they'd moved in overlapping circles of friendship in the years since. And although they had little in common politically, it was Alec who'd suggested the name Quadrant for the anti-communist literary and cultural journal of which Macaulay was the founding editor. It's typical of the way Alec and Rosemary rose above the cultural feuds of the time that they maintained such old friendships, often with people who'd fallen out amongst themselves quite bitterly. Ian Bolton also remembers that Rosemary long treasured a clipping of Macaulay's praise of one of her early books in the Catholic Weekly, annotating it as very precious. And in the present case, Alec and Macaulay agreed fervently on book design. Macaulay replied to Alec's letter with the comment that it had taken, quote, almost three years to bring out one of the nastiest designs and productions that ever disgraced Australian <laughs> publication. And he agreed to the suggestion of a Brindabella version. It would include all the poems from Music Late at Night with some new material, and at Macaulay's suggestion would be called Time Given. Alec admired the poems. They're lovely. It is their crystalline quality that appeals to me, the sense that you've got down to the pure substance of what you're saying. I think they are very beautiful and moving, and I would be proud to print them. The comment is a reminder that Alec was a discriminating reader and editor. He printed and published writing he admired. That was the point of all the effort. Printing time given was a race against terminal illness and Macaulay died before it was published. Alec showed him pages as they were printed and in his oral history interview recalled holding his breath while Macaulay looked at them for a long time. Now that is very nice, he finally said. I was greatly relieved that he approved. Deferring to his author's cautious approach to illustration and at his friend Gerald Fisher's suggestion, Alec asked Rod Shaw to write handwritten display text for a book, quote, that is otherwise rather severe. These poems are very restrained and classical, he said to Shaw. They're not morbid, but some of them are written against a background of mortal illness. The notion of calligraphy was suggested by the love he shared with Macaulay of the chancery italic of Ludovico Vicentino degli Arrighi, an Italian Renaissance type designer and scribe whose letter forms were drawn on in the 20th century by several type designers, notably by Frederick Ward and Stanley Morrison for the Arrighi italic designed to accompany Bruce Rogers' centaur typeface, a face Alec liked a great deal. And he was possibly the first to use the two in Australia. He thought he might, might have been. Both Alec and Macaulay had themselves adopted italic handwriting as adults. In Alec's case, under the influence of Henry Mund, the production editor of the Australian Encyclopedia during Alec's time at Angus and Robertson. Mund was a gifted typographer, he said, as well as having, quote, immense learning about books, someone whose influence Alec several times mentioned. He imparted to me a feeling for production that I had not had before, said Alec. That was a kind of seminal influence to me, which became very important. As for Rod Shaw, Alec had long admired his work as a commercial printer, although he was not a close acquaintance. The books printed by Edwards and Shaw are lovely, with generous margins, conservative but elegant typography, and good paper. Alec asked, it's a bit like the book the library's just published, actually. <laughs> it's a lovely book. Alec asked Shaw to consider italic capitals suggesting plantain with flourishes. Shaw, who'd known Macaulay since the 1930s, drew a great many alternatives for the title page and half titles and refused payment. And they're all still here in the Bolton Papers here at the library. Jim would have loved those titles, Alec replied. It's sad that he's not still around to see them. Shaw's generous contribution to the book belies post-Cold War views of the primacy of left and right binaries. Despite Macaulay's social and political conservatism and Shaw's own close identity with communist and progressive causes, they shared a history in Sydney cultural circles of the 40s, as did Alec and Rosemary in later years. 
1993, the distinguished bibliographer Marcy Muir gave Alec a copy of her memoir of her husband, the bookseller and writer Harry Muir, with the words, to Alec Bolton, in friendship and admiration for the Brindabella Press. It's an attractive little book, printed by Jim and Ruth Walker at the Croft Press at Cobargo, and illustrated with some of the book plates Muir commissioned from artists such as George Perrottet and Eric Thake. Her remarks on Harry Muir begin with a claim that I would repeat about Alec. And I quote, those who love books live in a state of constant anticipation and lively interest. It is a stimulating atmosphere. There's always the excitement of something fresh to look forward to or some new book which may prove unexpectedly rewarding. Many of our friends loved books and enjoyed their life. Alec was self-evidently one of these, a happy man whose achievement will be long with us. Writing this bibliobiography has been for me one of the great happinesses of my own life, and my hope is that others will enjoy reading it, perhaps even themselves finding it unexpectedly rewarding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Lexi back to the stage for two final poems. The Sleep Out by Les Murray. Childhood sleeps in a veranda room in an iron bed close to the wall where the winter over the railing swelled the blind on its timber boom. And splinters picked lint off warm linen and the stars were out over the hill. Then one wall of the room was forest, and all things in there were to come. Breathings climbed up on the veranda when dark cattle rubbed at the corner, and sometimes dim towering rain stood for forest, and the dry cave hunched woolen. Inside the forest was lamplit along tracks to a starry creek bed, and beyond lay the never-fenced country. Its full billabongs all surrounded by animals and birds in loud crustings, and sometimes kept leaping up amongst them. And out there, to kindle whenever dark found it, hung the daylight moon. Reading Aloud by Rosemary Dobson. Low, clear and free of self, your voice went on. At night, you read, and for how many years? From Stern to Kipling, Flaubert, Boswell, Proust, Proust a whole year. And finishing, you said, one of the great experiences of my life. And mine. And mine. Intent to listen, quieting my hands with plain and pearl, I followed your low voice, knitting unmindfully long scarves for friends, sent off as signs of that shared calm content still looked for in the unshared books I choose reading alone. Well, we gave up once, stalled on Cheselwit. How wrong it felt. You sensed a binding need to take books to the end. Faced with reverses said, we must press on from books to life, your thought, forgive, learn from the past, press on. And I press on.
thank you, Lexi. Um, thank you also, Michael, for drawing such a rich portrait uh, of Alec, uh, both tonight and in your book, Maker of Books. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Rob and Kate, members of the Bolton family who are here tonight, and also for those who are uh, watching online, either now or uh, later, for their support. Um, and I would also like to uh, echo Mary Louise's words earlier uh, of the brilliant work that's been carried on by those who've worked in our publishing teams uh, across the years. Uh, I think one of the uh, things that Michael mentioned tonight and that's in the book is around the up to a standard and not down to a price, which is certainly the spirit that we're looking to continue on uh, into the future as well. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time tonight. I'm sure you'd agree we could have spoken and listened uh, for hours. Uh, but I do hope that you can join us in the foyer for some refreshments. Uh, before you leave, please make sure to collect a gift uh, on your way out. You will receive a beautiful copy of our publication here tonight. Uh, and there are also copies of the book on sale in the bookshop, which make for excellent gifts, I can assure you. Um, thank you all again for coming, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Good night. <laughs>